Ah, it's an honor to, to have you. You're a very well known as an artist uh, working with AI. You're very well known doing NFTs and you're very well known as a collector and you bring all of this together in your uh, keynote now. So thank you very much and I think I leave you alone now. Not really leave you alone, but leave you on stage alone. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here. Annika, thank you for inviting me. And I am going to get started because um, I did actually create a whole new talk for this because I was really excited about the topic and I want to make sure it all fits in in the 45-minute time slot. So how has AI changed art making and art collecting? There is, um, there's so many ways and so many questions. And I'm actually right now participating in an art fair in New York City called Spring Break Art Show. And I've been sitting in my booth, which you see behind me in my virtual background. Um, and it's all AI generated artwork that I then painted and drew. And I've had the opportunity to kind of interview people as they come by and everyone's heard about AI artwork, especially text to image AI artwork. And everyone is really fascinated by the whole topic and where it's taking the field of art. So I think this is an incredibly timely um, issue to be discussing with everyone. And I want to kind of look at it through a bunch of stories of my own art adventures as an artist and collector. And that really began as an undergraduate. And I was a math major, not interested in computers. Um, and I think it was valuable because when I first heard about making artwork with a computer, I really thought it was a terrible idea. Um, and people find that hard to believe now, but I thought art had to be made with your hands and a real physical material. And I was like, what computers? I don't think so. So I always try to remember that feeling when people tell me that you can't make art with a computer and what am I doing? Um, because I do understand sort of people's initial knee jerk reaction to some of the things that computers can do in making art with them. So I try to be empathetic, but then convince them. Um, of what I now think is true is that the computer is a fantastic tool for making artwork. I um, obviously continued making art with the computer, but I met with a lot of resistance. And I was in grad school at the Rhode Island School of Design in the early 1990s, which was the time when actually a lot of digital art was already being created. And I found that um, I had visiting critics come from New York and literally refused to look at my artwork because I used a computer. And not even that they looked at it and said, oh, it sucks, but refused to look at it. So I decided I would um, put some really nice printer paper, I had BFK printer paper, through my laser printer, which I had just acquired, which at that time was incredibly exciting to have my own printer. And it came out really beautiful. It looked to me like an etching. And I put it on the wall for a critique, and I said it was an etching. Got very positive critique. And at the end, I revealed that it was made with the computer and sort of all hell broke loose and um, the response was extremely negative. And it really clued me into how people's perception of whether the final output was digital or analog really affected how they um, you know, thought about the quality of the artwork. And I think that is still true today. So when the final thing, um, like the image you see on the far right is an actual print, people assess it very differently from when it's the video on a screen or a digital printout um, and fully in the computer world. Oh, I actually stayed in Rhode Island where RISD is and Brown University and was in academia for quite a while working as an artist in residence in Brown's computer science department in their computer graphics research group and teaching the first computer fine art courses at Brown and RISD and working on a book that would have all the material I needed to teach the classes and kind of everything I learned that was in my brain at the time. And although I now do artwork full time, I sort of kept that academic connection and recently was actually at a Smithsonian um, archives research weekend where I got to meet one of um, my hero, Cynthia Goodman, whose book I taught from, Digital Visions, uh, way back when I was first teaching these classes. So it's, uh, it's exciting to see that institutions like the Smithsonian are now understanding that these early documents need to be preserved. And I think is a very positive um, sign for the whole field. So when I was working on this book, which took forever to write over six years, Michael Spalter, who was an art history major, 
said, you know, these people you're interviewing, these pioneers in the field of digital art, they're like the impressionists. The academy hates them. They have amazing bodies of work. They can't get their art shown. We should support them and maybe collect some of these works. And I was in a show at the De Cordova Museum and Sculpture Park with a wonderful artist named Richard Rosenblum. And we thought we would see um, how much his work cost. We went to his very Tony Gallery on Newbury Street in Boston and discovered that they couldn't get rid of his digital work, even though it was fantastic. And really for um, an amount that was less than the cost of the frame of the work, we acquired our first piece in 1992. And that led to um, our collecting work. We now have over a thousand pieces and have been lending to museums all over the world, but it started quite slowly with a few pieces here and there. And we actually had arguments over whether to buy a sofa or not, um, but we never had arguments over whether to buy artwork. And now have just, um, this has just come down, but there was a work at the Bell Center at UC Irvine in California, a retrospective of Vera Molnar with over 80 works, which we lent all of those works to that show. And upcoming, if any of you are in Los Angeles at LACMA, um, an amazing show curated by Leslie Jones that situates early computer artwork with other artwork that was made at the same time. And I think this is incredibly important because many shows sort of sequester digital artwork and help contribute to it being seen separately from the traditional art world. And I think shows like this are incredibly vital to getting digital art integrated into the traditional art canon. So our collection has all kinds of things in it um, from very early actually non-digital work like this oscilloscope photographs, repurposed bomb sighting machines, iconic pieces like Chuck Surrey's sign curve man, but most importantly for this talk, generative artwork. So if you're in this audience, you probably already know, but an algorithm is a series of instructions, a recipe, like a recipe for cooking something, step-by-step -step instructions for making an image. And with generative art and algorithmic art, there's usually also some element of chance or randomness. So the artist doesn't know exactly what the final work will look like. It's more a general feeling. And then something like the angles of the squares or which line becomes bold is up to some sort of chance or randomness in the algorithm. And um, Artists like Manfred Moore, who actually was working with cubes before Solowit, who also uses these types of algorithms, gave a talk in 1972, I believe, in which um, someone in the audience threw an egg at him. That was their response to this type of artwork. And so it's hard to imagine now maybe how, how much hostility these early artists met with. Uh, Jean-Pierre Hébert, whose work we also collect, created it's enormous um, plotter pieces with two layers of ink on them and often had to stay up for 24 hours, 48 hours to switch out pens on the plotter. And if one got gunked up and made a blob of ink, you would have to start over. So there's also sort of a physical endurance and challenge to making these works, um, which were sadly unappreciated. He actually uh, had a hard time showing in galleries and one that he went to he decided sort of like I did with the printer, not to tell them that he was using a computer and they loved the work and wanted to show it. And when he revealed that it was made with a computer, they physically escorted him out of the gallery. Um, artists like David Hockney, who is already so established in the traditional art world, were able to experiment with technology much more freely. And because the final works like this are enormous prints that are framed, think were easier for the traditional art world to accept. And I really love this piece just because it seems to be to be about technology as well with all the electrical things and has this little ghost kind of creature appearing in the plug. So if you're interested in more of why there was such hostility, some of which still lingers, but um, was especially virulent in the early years, I recommend hugely this book by Grant Taylor, um, The Machine Made Art, The Troubled History of computer art and discusses work by these pioneers like Frieder Naki and some of the work that I showed and why they had such trouble getting people to take the work seriously, even though it's obviously very beautiful. So 
we were working on this, collecting this artwork, um, mostly not showing it for a long time. We had curators come to our house, and literally laugh at us for collecting it. We, we told our daughter, there's a lot of little weird square things on the third floor, don't, don't sell them. Um, myself as an artist, I was doing a lot of large scale and public works, installations, trying to remove the computer from the screen reference, which seemed to really turn people off, I think because it sort of references television, screensavers, and with these immersive installations, you forget that it's digital. It's just the whole environment that you're inside and responding to. And this was at Spring Break Art Show in 2016, based on footage I shot from a helicopter flying over Manhattan and Brooklyn, and then brought back into the computer and processed with um, a custom plugin for After Effects to make these kaleidoscopic patterns. And it did also have video and printed canvases. This is another installation um, in Brooklyn called Vacation Planet. It was in the winter of 2020. And the idea is you would go inside and it was a respite from the cold and dreariness of New York in the winter. The photography was from Miami. It was very warm lighting and rented these chairs and palm trees and you could go in, plug in your laptop during lunch and just have a little mini vacation. It went very well and then as you know, around that time, everything in the world ground to a halt. This was the last show in that space that ran through its entirety. Everything shut down. I wasn't doing any big shows, installations. People couldn't gather together. It's just sitting by myself in front of the computer screen. And that's when I discovered NFTs. And it was a perfect time to be engaged in something that was strictly digital, that everyone was seeing online. And a little bit, um, how I responded to the idea of digital art in the beginning when I first heard about NFTs. I thought, what on earth is that? And why would I want to buy a JPEG that I can download? But then when I learned more about it, I really was um, intrigued, started making some, selling some, and became a true convert and then proselytizer, I would say, even for NFTs. Um, the ease with which you can sell and collect. And I think like many artists, probably every time I sell one, I, I buy one. It's hard to keep any ETH or Tezos in, in my wallets. Um, it's a fantastic community of people. The way that you can reach out and communicate with collectors. And of course, having royalties is just um, indescribably wonderful. If you're an artist, the first time I woke up and found out that something had resold and, and that I had royalties, um, I, I was emotional about it. it it's hard to describe. Uh, it's very different from what one experiences in the traditional art world. So um, I was loving the NFT world, collecting this generative artwork. And then I found out about art blocks and the idea of long form generative art. And I felt like, wow, that's a direct genetic descendant of everything that we're collecting and have been trying to support and, um, and show to the world. And unlike that work, this suddenly was, was hugely successful. So I was fortunate to join the curatorial board of Art Blocks um, right before Ringers dropped. And so Artblock was just sort of on the up and up. I was able to mint a bunch of ringers. I just, you know, saw them and thought they looked beautiful. I had no idea how, you know, crazy successful they were going to be. Um, they, they shot up in value, money started pouring in and it was such a different experience from um, collecting the work on paper that we had collected before, even though the technology and I think the aesthetics were, were very, very similar. And by the time summer came around with Fidenza's, um, the funds that had come into NFTs had propelled it into public consciousness. So people who had never thought about digital art were, were reading articles about it and learning about generative art and getting online and setting up MetaMask wallets. And it's incredibly exciting. I continued to make my own NFTs and, and 
was really doing NFT art almost exclusively because it was so much more, it was more lucrative and instantaneous and fun and sort of more joyful than the traditional art world had been. I was um, delighted and honored to be in a Sotheby's auction and actually got into the New York Times. And I'm certain that would not have happened without the whole NFT world. So it was a, it's a great time to have been in the digital art field and um, to use the whole NFT explosion as a way to try to educate people about digital art. I was part of a panel that Sotheby's put on and not for the first time, someone came up to me and said, wait, there was digital art before NFTs. And um, I tried to use that as a teaching moment for people. Uh, it's, it's always shocking to me when people ask that. But it's, um, I think it's good. It's good that people are becoming aware that there is a whole history. I think shows like the one coming up at LACMA will help educate people as well that digital art did not start with NFTs, that there's a whole long history and many things that came before it. But without NFTs, many people might not know about that history. So generative art, collecting, NFTs came together in this amazing way. And I don't know if any of you ever check out the crypto art market data, cryptoart.io, but you can see that Artblocks, which does on-chain generative art, and is that pink part of this bar chart, is a huge amount of the major ETH NFT sites. I was pretty surprised the first time I saw this to see that they comprise so much of the market. And for someone who's collected generative art for so long to see that is pretty astounding. So these things have come together. What's the next part that might really like bring this completely over the top to me? It's AI. So I kind of buried the lead of this talk, but here's the, this is the main point of the whole talk, that these Venn circles are all overlapping now in a way that I think is going to really impact the art world tremendously. And AI art, it's in the news everywhere, Dolly, Midjourney, people have heard of it. What is it? Why should you care? Um, although there has been AI art for quite a while, and we collect works by, for instance, Harold Cohen, who made an expert system, like a series of rules that created a drawing machine that makes work that is in his style. So there were things going on that fit in sort of a larger category of machine learning. But the type of work that you're seeing now is really all based on much more recent research into something called generative adversarial networks, which only came out in 2014. And the text to image part like Dolly 2, um, that research only came out in 2016. So it's incredibly recent. And the work that's in the show in Linz um, is generated with something called GANs, this adversarial network, and as a very high level idea of how that works. And to give an example of some actual work that I did with it, you have two image sets, an input set, a thing that discriminates and tries to decide whether in a series of learning cycles, its output is real or fake. So to give an idea of what this is going to look like, it starts out with the images you put in. It tries to learn and make them look more like the image set that you give it as output. And it gets closer and closer, and each time it says, is this sort of a valid member of the final set, or is it not? Is it real or is it fake? And it tries to get closer and closer to being like the final set that you gave it. So in this case, I gave it round images of my own artwork for my Instagram feed and airplane images that I took off the web. So it's sort of trying to make these look more like these. And it doesn't really succeed, but you can see it's going from more round to more weird and airplane-like. And after 250 learning cycles and throwing out ones that don't look like the, uh, like the airplanes, it ended up with these very strange um, things that looked like 
airplane crashes or UFOs, I thought were very cool compositions. Unfortunately, they were only 256 pixels across. And these are made with the playform.io, which is a web-based platform that anyone can use. I really wanted to take advantage of these strange AI compositions, but they were too low res for me to print out or do something with directly. So I ended up just using the compositions as a basis for oil paintings. I printed them out large and fuzzy and then painted over them and framed them and they were in an art show as we were coming out of the pandemic. And there you can see them closer up. And this goes back to the whole digital analog thing again too. This was one of my more successful years at spring break, I think because the end result was oil painting and people just saw it as painting rather than a digital thing. Using those same compositions, I wanted to make a large inflatable and did a pastel drawing based on the composition and worked with a 3D modeler to create a 3D version of it. I wanted to make it into a huge inflatable. I was only let into the, um, a show in LA at the last minute and contacted a bunch of companies who all told me that there's no way they could make this shape. It was too complicated. One was incredibly expensive. One was more reasonable. I went with the more reasonable one and I got back this rendering. I was um, almost canceled my participation in the show because I thought it doesn't look anything like my, my model that I sent them at all. I called the more, much more expensive company, worked for Jeff Koons and things and um, begged them to make my form and they, they took pity on me and made it. And it actually came out looking a lot like the 3D model. So that was really exciting. And those same GAN process is what I use to make the piece that is in Linz. And you can see they're all images of bridges, a lot of which I took myself because I'm obsessed with bridges and take photos when I'm driving out of my car window. And Windows is able to merge them all together. Style transfer you've probably seen, and this is a different piece of software called Night Cafe. It's also a website anyone can use online. And um, it doesn't have that just GAN uh, image set based approach, but you can easily do the style transfer, which you might've seen also sort of in little apps on your phone and things, but it has a more sophisticated approach to it. In this one, I put in an image I had taken on vacation and some of my own um, artwork, a pastel drawing and a digital piece. And it puts that style onto your image. So it keeps the composition that you give it, but it puts the color and texture of your other images. And I made a bunch of NFTs doing that. It's a really fun way to combine if you're an artist, your own work or, um, you know, other, other things together. But I think what everyone is using now and is the most exciting is this text to image AI. So those are the systems I really want to talk the most about. Um, I was doing a fundraiser image for Ukraine. And so here you can see, I was just typing in, and this is again in Night Cafe, different text phrases. And it's truly like magic. You type in, this is literally exactly what I typed in. So these are direct screen grabs and it made these images. I then combined some of them together in Photoshop to make the final piece. And how can that possibly work? And it's actually a combination of tagging images and that GAN process. So there's something called ImageNet, which I was amazed. This is a huge research database, millions and millions of images that human workers actually tagged with different categories saying like this is a cat this is a dog this is a table these are clouds and the um, the researchers used amazon turk to have you know low-cost human labor tagging them so to me there's something sort of funny and ironic that this powerful ai computer-based process is the result of just tons and tons of human labor
Um, Clip is another system and that actually learns automatically from text, uh, from images that have text that are on the web. And then whichever sort of image set and uh, method um, different systems use, it's paired with GAN to do this. So it takes the image, it takes the text and looks for images that has that text and goes through a repeated learning process to try to get the result that is going to best match that text. There's a lot of complicated mathematics in there, but um, that's the essence of it. And it still seems completely magical to me. So I've been amazed when um, I'm sitting in my little booth at spring break and saying, yes, I made these with text to image and everyone's like, oh yeah, they, uh, they just sort of take it for granted. So it's sort of very rapidly become part of our discourse. Um, I think this is going to animate maybe. Yes, okay, good. So I also did some work um, with a programmer using custom Python. Maybe, all right, I thought that was gonna animate more. This one may or may not have sound. I don't know if you can hear the sound. I'll talk over the sound anyway. So by using um, some custom software, we're able to enter different text prompts as the animation is happening to change the type of motion that's going on and the different text. So to create more of a narrative. And some of these things are now available directly in Night Cafe and other tools where you, you could do this kind of animation with more of a graphical user interface. So I've gone back and forth between custom things and off the shelf. Um, I personally don't think it matters which you use. Um, for me, it's just what the situation and artistic project requires. I went back to just the web-based software for this large drop I did. And I was really excited about this. I think this is sort of a way of the future that you can, especially with AI, because AI tends to create a lot of images that artists will be able to do large drops of one of one images where each one is kind of its own amazing individual artwork that in the past you might've released as just a one of one NFT or, or work in a series, but instead you can release as a big drop, sort of like an art blocks generative art drop, but an AI one, but have each one be really distinct, maybe more distinct than some of the generative um, drops have been. So I did this AI series um, of spaceships that had a whole narrative and um, that I just did on OpenSea and they were all created with Night Cafe and then upscaled with an amazing thing uh, called Topaz Gigapixel that uses AI for upscaling. And as I mentioned, uh, and it's by background, I'm currently doing this show and I use pretty much every system out there to create it. I put in text for, from the actual call for the show. The theme was Naked Lunch. And in one of the paragraphs that had this text, depictions of social encounters, depictions of the scene and free love hangs, often al fresco. And the name of my um, booth is Free Love Hang. So I put that into Stable Diffusion, Dolly 2, Mid Journey to create all kinds of different images. And I want to show some examples of um, things that didn't work, because I think uh, usually when you go, you know, obviously go to art show, you only see the things that did work, but to understand the process, it can help to see things that maybe the artist didn't choose as part of their work. So um, here in Mid Journey, initially I liked these, and then I thought sort of the compositions were too flat, but you could see just the prompt is literally that text from the call. Um, the way that I work with AI is to put in the text, look at the image, and then tweak it. Um, so I thought, uh, you know, I'll put in like different time periods, like Belle Epoque, different 
prompts like charcoal drawing because I knew I was going to make some as charcoal drawings or use different media and then kind of rinse and repeat. So um, just running processes over and over again. And then when uh, Mid Journey gives you a group of four things. So when you like one, then you upscale it. So I liked this one. And then that became one of the final pieces. Here's a bunch that didn't quite work out. So you can see it just got like, I thought overly tangled up, um, probably because I used the word sinuous, which is made it too, too tangled up and sort of ropey. Um, sensuous worked better and gave me this one, which became one of the final pieces. Sometimes you don't know if it's gonna work or not until you upscale it, it can look good and then you upscale it and for whatever reason, it doesn't completely pan out. I did a bunch in, in Dolly. I got access to it literally while I was creating the show. Um, each tool has its own language. So I had gotten pretty good at Mid Journey because I'd been using it for a while. When I started Dolly, this is the this was the, the first things that I made. You could see how incredibly bad it was. And I thought, oh, Dolly's terrible. I'm never gonna use it, but I got better at it after a while. And so you sort of learn how to talk to each one. And I started putting in, you know, the different phrases and you learn where to put commas and how to rearrange the prompts and everything. So I made a lot where, I don't know, there was just like way too many strings for the balloons or things were overly complicated. Sometimes you get a lot of bizarre text. And um, Dolly doesn't keep all of your things, I realized. So you have to save them as you go if you want to see them all. I thought I was going to always have them here on the right to look at, but it only keeps a few and then it then it deletes them. So here are some final versions. And then I drew, I printed and drew over them in different media for the show using charcoal and pastel and charcoal pencil and colored pencil, just a whole bunch of different media, depending on the image and the colors. And some that were black and white, I colorized with another AI tool, the Palette FM Bot. And this is something anyone can use, and it's free. It's on Twitter. So you just take your black and white or already colored image, and you tweet it to the bot. And it comes back with four different colorized images. And they all have alt text that describes how it was colored. And then you could retweet it with that text modified also to get different colors. So it's a really wonderful uh, color research tool that I used a lot for the show. So here you can see some of the works that are up and framed and to make it more of an immersive installation. We also put um, heart-shaped helium balloons and flowers and astroturf and things, which I think I have a photo of in a minute. So some of them I made into larger drawings. This is a Mid Journey one. I think these are both Mid Journey. So Mid Journey tends to be more artistic and better for uh, prompts like charcoal drawing or painting, I have found anyway. So another view. So I had done a lot of the colored ones that I was going to do as paintings in Mid Journey and then I got access to Stable Diffusion. So here's my first, my first one I made for that was uh, not safe for work. I actually got a little poop emoji and had to look underneath it. I think because of the free love prompt, I got like a kind of a Woodstock image. And um, I made a lot of things that didn't quite work out. Just a mass of hearts or things that were too pop arty or looked like um, a sort of descent into hell from the Sistine Chapel. I don't know, too complicated, but I kept reusing the same prompt with different weights and, um, you know, variations until I got one that I thought made a really fantastic composition uh, with a nice distribution of the bodies and sort of the pop art aesthetic with the hearts. It didn't create faces though. And I don't know if they're designed not to create faces, but, um, I couldn't get it to make faces. So I actually took the stable diffusion compositions back into Dolly and did in painting with text to make all the faces and then printed it on canvas and painted over it with acrylic. So they're pretty big paintings. Let 
that. Um, some of them are stretched and that one is unstretched. So you can see the view into the whole show. All right, so I think I read through everything pretty quickly. And we even have maybe some time for questions. Hello, I'm back. Um, thank you so, so much for your presentation. Um, do we have questions from the audience? Mario for sure has a question, your colleagues, no? No questions. Alfred Weidinger, we're like in school now. He also passes, operator. <laughs> I'm also, if anyone thinks of a question later on, I'm, I'm super accessible online, you can message me. And I mean, the interest on Instagram. Yeah. Twitter, Anya, Anya, Anya from Operator now has a question. There's now more sure. people in the audience having questions. <laughs> Thank you, Anne, for this presentation. I'm wondering if you think there is a limit between making art with AI and letting AI entirely make the art and where you think that line is and if you feel that the way that you're using it, you know, getting to know the machine, getting to speak to it, learn the different prompts and get really nuanced in your approach versus someone who heard about it goes on, types three words and then has it. Do you feel like that art should be seen and like compared next to each other, held at an equal standard or how would you kind of differentiate or evaluate that when it does become so easy to make an interesting image? Um, I, I believe that, that those images will not look as good or stand up because they're not part of someone's artistic practice. So, you know, you might, you might luck out and get one image that, that looks fantastic, but you're not going to build up a series of work that has some kind of meaning that way. And I think it's similar to photography and that maybe some of the issues are, are similar to when cameras first came out. and. People said, oh, wow, no, anyone can make a realistic image because that used to require, you know, tremendous skill for painting and drawing to make a realistic representation of something. So with the camera, then anyone could make a realistic depiction of something. And it seemed like, oh, anyone can press a button. So how is it artwork? And, you know, what, what, what will it mean? And then it became obvious that some people press that button and make art and make you know, really amazing things. And others, others of us can shoot hundreds of photos and yeah, maybe we get one that looks good, but we're obviously not photographers. So I think maybe you can't tell from one image, but you could definitely tell over time. I mean, that's a very good comparison um, with photography because being an artist does not only mean you, I mean, same with paintings, right? Everyone can create a painting, but that's the same conversation we just had, had with Mario. So there's basically other people who have to decide if what is being created comes from an artist. And that means also that you, that you have a context, that you have a concept, that you sort of like uh, know about the, the history of art, even the, about the history of the medium and everything. Um, so I guess, yeah, at some point people are selling just stuff created with Dali or whatever. Um, but everyone can also just sell a painting, no? Yeah, and Maybe. with generative art as well. I've seen some generative art projects where it just seems like someone got lucky and they made something amazing and then you look back and there's nothing before and there's nothing after, you know? But with other people, it's obviously part of a longer practice. And the you know, So I definitely look at that as a collector, you know, I look at that. And the interesting part is, I mean, in the NFT space, usually you have curators or museums or collectors like you, you know, when you and Michael collect work, it's, people look at it differently and are like, oh, they know about the history, then actually let's look at it again. There might be something we have missed, but in the NFT space, I mean, there's sort of like not really curators with a background in the digital art world, then very rarely, if not here at Francisco Carolino museums and so on, come in. Uh, so I guess that's what makes it even trickier 
to see a difference between what is art and what is not art. Uh, I think there was someone else with a question. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, are you afraid of um, the... F uh, because uh, AI-generated art is very new, so uh, nobody has very long experience with it, but do you think it could change your artistic style in some way after using it a lot? Like uh, you're starting to make something and uh, after, and then you decide to make it like the AI did it, but you, sh uh, you, sh uh, you wanted to make it in another way before you used AI, and that AI somehow controls or takes over the control over your, yeah, of, about the way you make art and your personal style. Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, for this show that I just did, it certainly impacted my style a lot. So I would say um, for the charcoal drawings, more of the style that people might know of my work came through. And then for the paintings, maybe more of the AI, like people might look at it and go, oh, definitely, you know, an AI was involved with this. Yeah. So I would say it, it, it influenced me, yeah. Okay. I don't know if it's good or bad. Yeah, I don't know. But definitely, it was there. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Operator again? Thank you, Anne. Uh, one of the aspects that really interested me was the bit about the display of digital work or the display of NFTs. Um, and you hit on something that really speaks to me, which is uh, displaying digital works within a, an immersive environment um, that kind of de-emphasizes that there is any digital aspect present, uh, therefore turning the attention to the artwork itself um, versus, you know, um, aspects that, you know, we see in our life where we're, we have fatigue of the screen or reminds us or is an indicator, wakes us up from the dream because this is also the medium in which I, I work or etc. Um, so could you talk a bit more about that process and how you approach, um, you know, displaying work in an immersive context? Um, yeah, it's definitely one of the reasons I started doing these larger immersive environments. And I think things that take the, the end product out of the whole TV screen reference space um, really help people engage better with the art. And I also like the little like uh, infinite object screens, um, everything that doesn't really look like, like a, t a repurposed TV or computer monitor. But I think there's a long way to go in finding good ways to present NFTs. You know, it's hard to have one screen that, that fits every aspect ratio. So you get weird letterboxing and things. Um, I also think each, each work should have its own screen and not have a whole, you know, like all your NFTs displayed on a screen one after another, to me makes them seem more like screensavers and less like artworks. So, um, but on the other hand, you don't want, you know, like your living room to have a thousand screens running all the time in it. So I think there's a lot of, of challenges. Um, in my own artwork, I've tried making small sculptures with embedded battery powered screens. So there's no wire and it's more of a sculptural object. And also um, larger things that I've called video prints that have a printed background with an embedded screen and a cutout shape. So I have a big one in my living room. It's like five feet across. It's a big circular print and then the middle is moving and the rest of it is still. And that addresses just the physiological fatigue that you get from the screen a lot of video art can work well, you know, in a lobby or an institution, but when you have it in your home and you have a screen that's bright and running all the time, it's, it's exhausting for your brain because, you know, you're evolutionarily primed to look at motion and light. It's hard to have that running all the time. Oh, it's good to find ways of, of having something that is video maybe, but it's not constantly, you know, calling your brain to attention. 
Okay, great. Thank you so, so much, Anne, for being with us and for accepting the invitation. It was a huge honor. And yeah, people can find you on Twitter. If there's more questions, we always publicly discuss everything. So yeah, please meet Anne on Twitter, same as all the other speakers. And yeah, now Lynn Hirschman-Leeson. Thank you and have a nice day at the fair. Thank you so much.